Well, good evening, everybody. Um, as it says up there, I am David Payne. Um, I am the director of the Zeppler Institute for Photonics and Nanoelectronics, which was only formed uh, in its current form on August the 1st um, of this year. So it's very new. And uh, we were fortunate enough uh, to have Temis Prodromakis join us. Um, and, of course, it's a great pleasure because he's already gone off like a rocket, um, which is typical of Temis. And one of the things he's done um, is he has uh, decided that it's high time we reinstituted what tonight's event is all about, uh, which is an inaugural lecture, in which um, the purpose of that is to learn about what Temis does, um, but, remember this please, it is also to give him a bit of a roasting of memoirs of the things that he might not like to remember. So I've only been his boss for a couple of months and I'm therefore not going to tell you any of the things about him because it's too early yet, um, but others I hope will do exactly that, possibly in the, correct, in the introductions, in the wrap-up at the end, um, and in any of the questions. So an appropriate question would be, do you remember the time when you did X or Y and, and embarrass it? That is appropriate um, for an inaugural lecture. So, you've heard enough from me, um, but we have, uh, as well as the whole distinguished audience tonight, um, we have Neil Alford, Associate Professor of Imperial, um, who will perform the introductions and begin the roast and Professor Chua from UC Berkeley, who is in fact the inventor um, of Memristas in 1971. So you couldn't get more distinguished than that, right? The very subject uh, with which uh, Temis is going to enthrall us, I'm sure. So, over to you, Neil. Okay, my name is Neil Alford, and I'm from Imperial College, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here um, to introduce Themis. Um, so I, I'm very pleased to begin the proceedings, and thank you, David, very much indeed for inviting me. And we're here for the inaugural of Themis. I first met Themis at Imperial, it must have been 10, 11, 12 years ago, something like that. And he just finished his PhD uh, at Imperial and was responsible for the clean rooms. I can remember that very well. And at that time, he worked very closely, I think you still do actually, with Chris Tumazu. Uh, he's the Regis Professor at Imperial. Now, Chris can't be here, sadly, so I asked him for a couple of words. And uh, he sent me a couple of pages. Uh, so here are a couple of extracts. Themis was incredible. His love of devices, combined with his extraordinary ability to invent electronic circuits, put him in, in such a unique position to transform the field of memristors. We worked so well together and went through an extraordinary phase of inventing circuit after circuit. While at Imperial, he persevered around the clock not only to convince the academic community, but research councils, government, and international funding bodies that the field would impact upon the future of technology. He was successful. By then, I had supervised nearly 50 postdocs, and Themis stood out because of his addictive enthusiasm and his love and passion to create. So, thank you, Chris. Now, it was pretty clear to me that Themis was destined for a glittering career, but I wasn't sure whether it would be an industry or in academia. As it turns out, it's in both. At Imperial, Themis ran into the young academic researcher with a young family in London problem, and very wisely decided he'd make a move, and he went to Southampton. I cannot say what a brilliant move that was. Bad for Imperial, really brilliant for Southampton. So it was a fantastic decision, it really was. 
And it's, the, it's proved to be the absolutely ideal environment for Themis. He became professor within five years, and his achievements are already quite spectacular. His research is in the area of memoristas, for which he's raised over £20 million of research funding and built a very successful research group. He started up ARC Instruments and has already has customers like Toshiba and Huawei, for example. Now, I'm not going to tell you about the memoristas. We're going to hear that in a few minutes. Uh, but suffice it to say that they have an exceptionally bright future. They have, uh, the memorista has an annual average growth rate, I couldn't believe this, of 65% over the last five years. I mean, that's extraordinary. If only our, if only our economy was that good, <laughs> it would be brilliant. So I applaud Themis for his wisdom in identifying a promising research area. So my heartfelt congratulations to you, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Right, so planning this is one thing, but delivering it is a different thing. And, uh, you know, it's really uh, exciting that, you know, we have uh, so many good friends here. And, and thank you so much, Neil, for conveying, you know, this uh, introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk about memoristic memories and, and my journey through this sort of research. But before I start, I just wanted to share with you my inspiration. My inspiration has been about understanding the human brain this extraordinary machine that essentially has this superb complexity. You have over 100 billion neurons interconnected and it always delivers, it always does stuff reliably. This is one of my passion. Combine it with my other passion, and actually this is uh, one of the last times that I ever st step into a clean room, as my friend Ali will tell you, which was still back at Imperial. <laughs> although I did go through the uh, training process here. Uh, but my passion about nanotechnology is actually thanks to a few people, some of them that are here, Christos Papavasiliou, my PhD advisor, and uh, I want to start by obviously thanking my academic father for all this wonderful trip, as well as George, George Konstantinidis and Kostis Michalakis. George Konstantinidis, not the one of Imperial, the, the one that runs uh, the clean rooms in Crete in Forth, uh, where I actually took my first training lessons in nanotechnologies and how to, to process different devices. And Kostis Michalakis, with whom together we worked in establishing one of the clean room facilities at Imperial. So you take the two together and you get a career ambition. So my career ambition is a bit all, all over the place, to be honest, uh, but it's simply using the fantastic tools that we had at Imperial as well as Southampton, uh, employing nanotechnologies for doing two things, linking biological functions to engineering systems, and then also try to emulate and biological systems and learn from biology on how we can actually improve on modern electronics. So let, let, me, let me take you very, very quickly through the different topics, a bit of a history review, linking biology with electronics, we started with uh, a PhD student of mine, one of my very first PhD students at Imperial, Tatiana Trandidu, who uh, started developing advanced neural interfaces, things that you could stick in a brain to get something out of it, or flexible platforms that you can do the same. Then we started working more on synthetic biology, trying to change the, the way that surfaces react to liquids. And uh, this was started by Tatiana, and it was uh, followed on here at Southampton by one of my PhD students, uh, Ilaria Sanzari. So doing that and using that for uh, putting cells in very specific locations, because we wanted to emulate the way that biology actually is uh, structured. It's not developed, cells do not develop in an anarchy. They actually follow a very, very specific structure. And mimicking that structure is very useful, apparently. That's what the pharmaceuticals told us. GSK, for example, with whom we were collaborating here for developing uh, <coughs> different assays for testing the drug toxicity, of, uh, the toxicity of drugs. And then other ways of interfacing with biology, like the work that uh, Marilena has done here at Southampton, which is how do you wirelessly and remotely actually stimulate neurons at that scale. 
the stories go on on how you can link to biology with uh, work that, for example, a team did here at Southampton, uh, led by myself, Costas, uh, Nikos, a PhD student, which was essentially using printed circuit board technologies for developing affordable point of care diagnostics that we've even tested for uh, 40B in, uh, in different uh, hospitals in London. But enough about how we can link to biology. Let's see what happens on the other side of the spectrum. How can we emulate biology with electronics? In order to tell you this, I would actually need to explain and review the modern electronics needs. What is it really that we need as a society? Where are we at and what can we do about this? Everyone is probably aware of Moore scaling law. Moore scaling law says that the number of transistors doubles every one and a half year roughly. And that's something that we have actually used for over seven decades now. This is what brought us the revolution of mobile phones. That's why we have in the latest smartphone something in, in the order of five and a half billion transistors. But we need to think about them as simple switches that store zeros and ones. That's all they do. Zeros and ones, but orchestrated in this fantastic way to give us Siri, to give us access to our emails, to give us access to the internet and to the web. And we want more. We wanted more calculations per second. And we wanted, obviously, to achieve this by having more number of transistors per unit area. Is this sustainable? Well, it, w it became sustainable after a while where Zach Kilby, who got the Nobel Prize in physics in 2000 for his work on the integrated circuit, uh, put everything together and started using these switches in a very unique way that gave us modern electronics industry. Uh, I specifically put here the a photo of the first integrated circuit created by Kilby just to remind ourselves and remind our students as well of how ugly it was. A bit of silver paint sticking stuff together and that actually got him the Nobel Prize. So when I hear from our students that, you know, it does, it's not pretty, that the results don't look well, it's not, you know, like up to the standards, just, you know, get on with it because you might actually be doing something that really worth even a Nobel Prize. You never know. He definitely got one. So is this enough? Can we really continue scaling? Well, Richard Feynman, another Nobel laureate, said that, yes, we can. And he gave this famous talk uh, a few decades ago uh, entitled, There is Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And what he actually said was partially right because nowadays we have all these fantastic manufacturing capabilities that even allow us to control individual atoms. Just pause to think about this. Controlling individual atoms for making electronic devices is, is something extraordinary. But can you really create these switches reliably? We could up to now, but having being able to manipulate a few atoms at that scale creates a lot of different issues, like a big variance on when exactly your switch will actually toggle from a zero to a one, from off to on. And that's causing a lot of issues in the modern electronics. Uh, 2018 is actually going to be a year that we will all remember. I'm hoping because a little bit because of my inaugural lecture as well, but <laughs> mainly because we do have the end of Moore's law here. It's something that we've been talking about for a very long time, but no one is really taking seriously. Industry, however, took the first step. They just announced a few weeks ago, uh, Global Foundries announced that they're halting their plans for the seven nanometer scaling. This is really significant. This is really the first time that industry admits that we can't do much about it. It's costing us so, more, so much to actually keep scaling that it's not, it's not efficient to keep doing that any, any longer. On, on the other side, artificial intelligence is keeping up, bringing up, you know, like a new era. Guess which one has artificial intelligence? So the one on the left is the latest DARPA challenge for robotics. No artificial intelligence. You can see, I mean, you know, 
you feel for these guys, right? It's, it's a bit silly. Boston Dynamics is doing a fantastic job. It's a fantastic movement. It's, it's like a human. And this is my favorite bit. And my son's favorite bit. A backflip. Come on. It's really amazing. Right. But this is not something that comes for free. That artificial in intelligence enabled sort of processors only comes, you know, like at the cost of uh, having a huge battery that will run, you know, quickly, very quickly actually will run out. So we need to ask the question, what do we do fundamentally different, we as the human beings with the human brain compared to standard, you know, computers? And I keep asking these questions whenever I go around for outreach events to high school students saying, you know, which one do you think is going to actually win, a human brain or a supercomputer? In reality, you know, this is, is, is not a question that, is, that actually has an, an answer because both systems have evolved for very, to do very different tasks, to solve very, very different problems. On one side, computers are following very sequential and centralized execution of predefined routines. On the other side, the human brain is extremely parallel and distributive, and it's, it, it adapts all the time to the, the stimuli that it receives from the environment. The processing units, on one side, they are very slow, simple, but you have plenty. You have billions of neurons. On the other side, they are fast, complex, but they are a few. The fundamental difference, however, lies that the memory is collocated with the processing capability in the, in the neurons, in the human brain, where when we're looking at the computers, they are actually separated from processors. And that, all in all, it allows you to actually do very robust and graceful, even allow for graceful degradation. I mean, we lose, this is remarkable, we're losing one neuron per second. Kill, 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 kill. One neuron per second, this is amazing, yet, I'm still able to stand here and deliver this lecture to you, hopefully reliably till the end. So this is something that, you know, we could take inspiration from. And I forgot to mention, of course, that this is only done at the cost of 20 watts, extremely energy efficient. What can we learn from that? Can we emulate, actually, synapses with memory stores? Uh, another role model for science, Eric Kandel, who got the Nobel Prize in Physiology back in 2000, and to whom I was introduced by, by Professor Tsua while I was in Berkeley through his fantastic uh, autobiography, In Search of Memory. And uh, it's, he got the Nobel Prize because he simply uh, discovered that memory is transcribed in neurons and in chemical synapses in this particular way. You have a presynaptic neuron, a postsynaptic neuron, terminals, two terminals, and then in between, in between you have this synaptic cleft where you have the release of neurotransmitters whenever neurons fire. Now that, to me, as an engineer, very abstractly, looks similar to that, which is nothing more than a memory store. Essentially, you have two terminals, you have a top and a bottom electrode, and in between you have your barrier, which is nothing more than a metal oxide system where diffusion happens the same way the same dynamics at nanometer scale. That's really fascinating. What are memristors, however? So largely, we are here because, and I'm giving this talk because of Professor Chua, and I'm really thankful that uh, you, are, uh, together with Diane, your wife, uh, flew all the way through Berkeley to be here with us tonight. Uh, really appreciate that. So Leon is really the father of nonlinear circuits, but as well as the inventor of memristors. And back in 1971, he had this seminal paper where he said, this is the missing circuit, uh, the missing circuit element, uh, describing purely from a theorist's point of argument that there must be an element uh, linking charge with flux, as, for example, we have the resistor linking voltage with current and so forth. But Lin's discovery back then had many ramifications later on that we only realize today. And thank you, Neil, for this interesting facts. I didn't know that we were actually growing 65% a year. That's, that's really incredible. So on the right-hand side, we have Stanley Williams, who was working at the same time 
uh, on two terminal emerging memory technologies based on metal oxide systems, titanium oxide in particular. And his success was that exactly 10 years ago, he published this famous paper in Nature uh, saying that we found the missing memory store. Simply because he managed to correlate the characteristics, the signature plots of, which is nothing more than a pinch IV loop in, in, the, in the current voltage domain, you have the pinch hysteresis loop. And he managed to correlate these characteristics with the devices that he was fabricating. But this is not something that we didn't know before Hewlett Packard. In fact, through the interactions I had with Leon, he, he really helped me to see the world with a very different perspective. And we started looking back, uh, trying to identify all the ways two centuries ago on devices that were made by human beings that actually follow the same inertia, the same pinch hysteresis characteristics. And how many of you in here know who Sir Humphrey Davy is? How many here know who Faraday is? Sir Humphrey Davy was really the lucky person to be around in the 1800s where Volta discovered the voltaic pile. And he was a lucky person to be the, at the Royal Institution back then uh, as the director of the Royal Institution. He was a lucky person to get his hands on Volta's voltaic pile and stack a few of them in series and realize really large potentials. And through that, he did three fundamental discoveries. He has done electrolysis. He has actually stimulated, was one of the first people to see the galvanic effect. So he stimulated the legs of a dead frog. And he also managed to bring two carbon electrodes in good proximity and observe discharge. So he was really the first person who ever created an artificially made light through this discharge, the electric arc. And thanks to him, we actually have the modern lighting industry nowadays. Now, an interesting story behind that is that not only this has the pinch hysteresis loops that memristors <coughs> do, and therefore should qualify as a memory store and possibly the oldest man-made memory store. Uh, but at that time, England was actually in war with France. And Napoleon was so interested in scientific discoveries. And despite all the issues that they had, imagine two, two actually countries being in war. And the guy was interested, you know, he was really fixated about scientific discoveries. So he sent someone with a secret passport to and a few, a, a bit of money to help Sir Humphrey and his wife to travel to Paris, despite all the issues that were in war, to give a lecture in Paris. And he actually provided some assistance, some money for assistance for the trip. And uh, Sir Humphrey went on and he, he, got, he got someone to help with this. Guess who that person was? That was Faraday. So Sir Humphrey Davies is an extremely important person, and he was really the mentor of Faraday. So talking about being at the right place in the right moment, you know, because he was around when Volta discovered the voltaic pile, I kind of reflected a bit on, on my career so far, in the past 10 years or so. So being at the right place in the right moment, actually, I don't believe in coincidence. I, I don't believe in, in chances. I, I do believe that we all are in control of our own fate based on what we do and you know, the choices that we make. Um, and in 2008, it was really a remarkable year for me because I've just finished my PhD with Christos, which was in, in defect engineering, quite a topic. I obviously, I never thought that, you know, I was trying to avoid defects, then try to utilize defects in a nice way, and then memristors came along, which were all about defects engineering. So I came across the Hewlett Packard's paper that Chris Dumazu brought it on my desk and said, check out what these guys are actually doing. They're talking about some memristor or something. It would be great to use this as a sensor. That's how I got actually involved in this. I joined the uh, the Center for Bio-Inspired Technology, which was really a great place to be with fantastic colleagues and, uh, and uh, other people, you know, broader in the college. And I started producing my own memristors. And that's also when I've met Leon in Berkeley. Now, five years later, after I've been developing all of this research and starting with a relatively small yield on the devices, I remember we were fabricating, we had something like 5 to 10% of the devices working 
you know, making a hundred devices and actually have five that do something interesting. That's remarkable. <coughs> right? And I got my, uh, my uh, readership here at Southampton in 2013. In fact, it was April's full day. First of April, still remember that. Uh, but the right place and the right moment, as, as Neil said, because I got access immediately to the uh, Southampton and Fabrication Center that Sir David, together with Peter Osborne, which is really great to have here with us today, helped to put together after the massive fire that we had 10 years ago, which is a quarter of a billion pounds facility and it's really rare to have in a university. And I still remember bringing some of my guys from my team from Imperial and saying, come with me and check out this place. I think it, it, it looks interesting. We could do some good stuff. And, uh, and thankfully, a, a lot of them came with me and we, we made the decision to relocate to Southampton. But at that time, uh, April, I started my, uh, my position here, my post here. A month later, I got my EPSRC Early Career Fellowship, which was a fantastic thing to, to come along. A, a month after, I got a, a big European grant, and I think two months later, but by September, we had something like uh, four or five million pounds in the bank. So the best way to start, Bashir was very happy, obviously keeping your bosses happy. You know, as you start, you, know, you already paid off the investment. And because of that investment, obviously, we developed the team. This was the biggest gamble kind of that I, I, I had to do as an academic because I didn't go for a, a conservative approach. Uh, we went for a very a truly interdisciplinary team, ranging skills you know, from material science, solid state chemistry that I didn't even understand, to be honest, at that moment. I was an engineer all the way to the devices, to building the circuits and computation. But that really paid off. And let me take you through that wonderful work. We fabricated, obviously, these devices here at Southampton, up to six and eight inch wafers. We have plenty of those devices, you know, at large scale, making them, this is how memristors look like. You have single devices, it's just a cross point, or you can have them in crossbar configurations. Uh, on the other extreme, we've, we've used Southampton's facility to make the smallest you know, the largest sort of density ever reported, even up to date. This is one and a half by one and a half micrometers. For those who don't know what micrometers are, if you take a single hair, the diameter of a single hair is about 100 micrometers. So imagine how small these are actually. We have about 1,024 in, in this, in this uh, configuration. And then we started screening all sorts of different materials. Plenty of opportunities there. And as Leon says, everything switches. I, I tend to say that everything ages. And everything ages because uh, the ugly truth is that these devices you cannot just simply use endlessly without considering you know, whether they're going to die, whether they're going to break out. So we've identified this along with many other research groups from early on. We've identified that there are this sort of uh, uh, operation regimes where you have a soft breakdown above which you do your business. You can do some reversible switching, but you want to stay away from this hard breakdown where irreversible switching occurs and it's not something that you can control so nicely. So my ex-PhD student just graduated, Maria Trapacelli, did some really nice work with using doping for pushing this boundary further down, obviously, for having devices that can operate at lower power and pushing this further up for making devices more resilient and more difficult to break. But it wasn't just that. We were not happy with, this, with the testing instruments that we would have around. In a typical academic world, what, what people do is you fabricate a million devices, you find one that does something exciting, you publish a paper in Nature, you get your promotion. We didn't want that. We had the facilities, we were at the right place, so we really invested a lot in developing an, our own bespoke instruments for testing all of these devices en masse, testing loads of them, millions of these devices. And that's a, a piece of work that we've actually initiated with an ex-PhD student of mine, Radu Berdan, who's now working in Toshiba, who ended up being also the CEO of a company that we started between him, myself, Christos, and Alex, and with zero investment. This company has been running for about three years now, and we've sold, we're almost getting close to 100 customers worldwide, but we're proud that we have, with zero investment, 
we are able to employ people, and we are actually able to uh, uh, work with co leading comp companies like Huawei and Toshiba, who are actually using our instruments nowadays. This instrument, however, was really important for us for pushing further the boundaries. I spoke about switches earlier on, that we've been using transistors as switches to store zeros and ones. What's fundamentally different about the work that we did and really pushed the boundaries there is that we introduced a new kind of switch, which is only two terminals, and it cannot just store zeros and ones. It can store even up to 100 discernible memory states. A single device, a single switch, that actually allows current to flow, flow a bit more, flow a bit more, and so forth. Much akin to the biological synapses that we want to emulate. And this, to the best of our knowledge, is still the state of art. The Southampton's technology in terms of the metal oxide memory source is the state of art as using them as analog memory components. And the beauty of this is that you can store them non-volatilely. It means that you program the devices and then you don't need to maintain the state. You don't need to burn any power to keep the state there. So in an analogy, it's like I'm using my computer, and then I'm switching off the computer. I, I will unplug it, but when I plug it in back again, everything immediately will come back instantaneously without burning any power. And that's fantastic because we could use this as a tunable load. We can tune the different resistance, resistance levels arbitrarily as we wish only consuming picojoules of energy, really tiny, tiny amount of energy. Uh, and this programming is actually done in a very energy-aware manner. So it's not just a switching threshold that you need to exceed to go from one state to the other. You can do it in many, many different ways, which is known as a time voltage dilemma in the community. And that's something that people have felt that it's a challenge but here, actually, I always like to see challenges as opportunities. And that's exactly what allowed us to invent new application. New application demonstrators. Obviously, the one that is crying out here is, let's use this technology for memory. But this is what everyone else is doing in the world. And someone told me once that try to speak about the things that no one else is talking about. Try to think out of the box and try to you know, offer something that the world actually would like to hear about, but they don't really see the relationship. So I'm going to focus on three main examples beyond memory. Example one had to do with how we can uh, emulate in silico, in a piece of silicon, we can emulate advanced biological learning rules. What we've done is we've used our devices and our instrumentation, and we demonstrated that the device can learn and forget. It can, so it can be potentiated. It could learn and, and can forget in a similar way that the human brain does. And once you do that, you can actually take this and start building little interconnected networks like that, interconnected networks of neurons, winner-take-all networks, they call them, that they can do the following. You, have, you don't teach them anything. They self-learn, and this is the beauty of, this, of these implementations, which is based on unsupervised learning uh, uh, implementations. So all the data that is coming in is automatically tuning, self-adjusting the weights of your memory stores, and in the end of the day, you have different neurons that have learned to identify specific patterns. And this is really cool, because you have no prior knowledge about this, and the other beauty about this thing is that uh, even if the data changes over time, the system autonomously <coughs> will learn how to change its weights and find the right solution to that. This is one example that uh, we, we developed as part of a, a project called, funded by EPSRC called Pneuma. The second example has to do with we need to start thinking of we have a completely new substrate here, a new different technology. So perhaps the ways that we're designing electronics are not appropriate here. Our world is really analog. We don't smell in six bits precision. We don't touch and feel in seven bits precision. We don't hear with a fixed uh, uh, precision. We, everything is analog, truly analog. 
Nonetheless, because of the energy efficiency and the scaling constraints that I've mentioned, all of our electronics, perhaps Chris Tumas would argue otherwise, but the 98% of our electronics is digital. Right, and for a very, very good reason. So there is, there is a mismatch there of what you do. You use something that is, is you know, there is a, a, a discrepancy there. And when you look at the individual technologies, as a design paradigm, you have the analog design, the digital design, and then you have the so-called mixed signal. But the mixing is done at the signal level. The technologies below still remain separate. <coughs> so one of my uh, research fellows and now associate professor in, in my group, in Zettler, uh, asked the question, what will happen if we take a fundamental building block, a digital block, which is nothing more than an inverter and has these transfer characteristics, very digital in its, in its own right, and we stick in there two of these analog memory stores that we develop. What would really happen? It was something really magical happen because you take something that's fundamentally tuned for digital and you, you make it behave as an analog gate. So you have a analog world, analog computation, which is very powerful, but at the cost, at the energy efficiency of digital. So it's a win-win. Not only you have that, you can go and reconfigure this individual weight. And by doing that, you have a, an electronic platform that can be tuned as you wish to do different things. It's highly reconfigurable. And if you start sticking a little bit of extra circuitry on the side, what you could do is you can create very efficient classifiers. So you can run this very, very locally, and uh, it's extremely energy efficient. The third example has to do with how we can process big data, but really at the edge. We hear about big data all the time. Artificial intelligence is coming in because we need to develop new ways and methodologies for dealing with, with big data in real time. And, and we took a very different example because we had, uh, and I'll use Christus's favorite one, Minions, to explain this. So electrophysiologists, if you talk to them, they have this huge problem. They have to tap into the human brain and they have to link to as many as possible of those you know, 100 billion neurons and, and record all the activity in real time. This is really a daunting task. You, we cannot even do that for 100 channels nowadays, not even for 100 neurons. And what is typically needed is you have a system like that, and in an analogy, it's like you have a, an amphitheater full of people, and every single one of you is a neuron. So myself, as an electrophysiology, my interest is to know, first of all, is there anyone in the room? which is what I need to do, to do for, for us uh, answering this question is, I need to have a microphone in here, and if I pick up some noise, I could say that there is some activity in general, but as simple as that. And that's a spike detection. But if I want to know if Neil specifically is in here, I need to have a way of uh, monitoring, picking up his voice, recording his voice, and matching that into a template somewhere else. And that, as you can imagine, uh, is something that is not so easy to do. It's, it requires a lot of processing power to do this. So that's the spike sorting. And in both cases, you have different interfaces to do that, and you have different processors to do this. Uh, but the main problem, as you will imagine, is the problem of power, of bandwidth, of area, and even complexity to do this in real time. So how did we go about solving this? First of all, we thought that let's use the tricks that biology does. Let's use the tricks that, for example, the human retina does all the pre-processing uh, before we actually, any, any input, optical input that we receive, we don't pass it on through the uh, optical nerve to be processed further in the human brain. Simply because we don't have the capacity in the human brain with all this 100 billion complexity of neurons. We don't have the capacity to do that in real time. And at the same time, we don't even have the bandwidth to process all of this data. And this is something clever that the, the retina does. It's, it pre-processes all the information at the edge. And only when something weird happens, 
he sends it to further pre-process, to be further pre-processed and say, okay, something, there is a fire back there, so I need to do something about this and creates a bit of attention. So we, we, we used exactly the same concept by embedding local capability to detect, process, and store this information very efficiently. And that's an idea that uh, I started discussing with a couple of colleagues in Europe, and we started a program called RAMP that finished about a year ago. And it was, it was uh, a work I'm gonna show you was spearhead, spearheaded by Isha Gupta, an ex-PhD student in my group, and now working for Galvani Bioelectronics and GSK. So you have your memory stores, you have the no switching and the reversible switching, and when you start exceeding the switching thresholds, you start changing the resistance gradually in your devices. Well, that's, that's really great for us because that's how the signals look like, and all we need to detect is whether one of these spiking events occurs. And, and the beauty of this is that we can transcribe any of those single spikes into a change in the conductance of the device, which means that you, you're using the thresholding integration capability of the devices for simply passively listening of what sort of activity exists there. You don't need to f spend any energy to go and monitor continuously. So having an, a mic that is always on and spending energy for that, and you can afford to go whenever you wish and see how much activity there's been there. And not only you can do that, you can also start doing spike sorting because the change in the conductance is actually analogous to the whole energy scene, you know, like carried out essentially by these spiking events. So that's really great. Obviously, if you have a device that speaks the same language with biology, the uh, question comes, why don't you simply use that device to interface to biology? It's only natural that if you have someone who can speak a second language to use that person as the translator. And that's exactly what we did at the end of this uh, European program, where we, for the very first time, we linked the biological real neurons grown in, in Padova, in Stefano Vassanelli's lab, via Southampton acting as the hub, and linking that to artificially made neurons, to neuromorphic circuits that are using exactly the same processes that we're using for making mobile phones. So you have the, the biological on one side and the artificial world on the other side interlinked, and the input from that is fed back. What does that really mean for our future? How can these technologies really shape modern societies and the future? Well, I can tell you how I actually have been shaping myself to start with. I said that every five years I do something. Uh, and uh, it looks like you know, we, we kept that promise here with David. So I started 2008 at Imperial, 2013, you know, moved it in, in uh, relocated Southampton. Don't worry, I'm not relocating again. But we relocated internally because we just started <laughs> We just started the uh, Zeppler Institute for Photonics and Nanoelectronics. And, and given that all of this uh, work has been going so well and we had so much interest in the research uh, aspects of this, it only made sense to, to, to join the Zeppler Institute and work with uh, some fantastic colleagues in the ORC. And see the new synergies now also with photonics. Uh, and we were, we were really grateful because that was a, a very timely moment where we received our new program grant, which started in April, about 12 million pounds worth of investment. Uh, we got a, a, a big European project that just started, and investment from, from the Royal Society as well. And our role now into the, the new department is in developing this new group called the Electronic, uh, Electronic Materials and Devices Research Group. And, and I'm really thankful with Derek to Huawei. Specifically, I'd like to publicly announce that Huawei has recognized the, the work that we're doing in this field. And uh, just only this week, they, uh, they pro made a very generous donation towards the development of this new group in the order of 200,000 US dollars. And we are very, very thankful for your contribution for that. Obviously, we, want, we keep working with our key uh, uh, industrial stakeholders, and we keep trying to push further you know, the boundaries. So what's really the value of memory stores and how we compare this to state-of-art technologies? Definitely power savings, definitely the compression of, of information, but we can also benefit from 
uh, more efficient use of the silicon real estate so we can have significant savings in, in the way that we integrate electronics. And I hope I convince you that there are some fantastic other opportunities well beyond the conventional memories that we've been thinking about and we're trying to solve with these technologies. Let me share my view. I'll try to be a prophet here and, and share what, with you what the world would look like in five, in 10, and in 20 years from now because of, this, of these technologies. First of all, we very much believe that this technology would really enable the uh, pervasive intelligence putting intelligence really at the edge, where it's very, very much needed. And one great opportunity to address there, one challenge is making the world a safer place. <coughs> and uh, this is, uh, is not just work that relates with the research that we do with Memristos, but is work that uh, I, I was really delighted and truly honored to act as a director of the Lloyd's Register Foundation International Consortium for Nanotechnologies. We've had someone here from the foundation. I'm really thankful for this fantastic opportunity, which with the funding from the Lloyd Register Foundation, we're actually uh, making the world a safer place through nanotechnologies, pushing the boundaries, and we are doing that by funding over 50 individual PhD research projects worldwide. Not just at Southampton, this is really worldwide, across a number of different areas. So we very much hope that within the next five years, really the world would be a safer place, also because of Memristos and the way that we can embed them locally. In the 10 years time, people are really concerned. They rely more and more in the connectivity to the cloud for doing stuff. They're relying to the connectivity to the cloud for running Siri locally. You cannot do that. You still need to have connectivity to the cloud. Uh, but people are also concerned about the privacy of the data. Do you really want Alexa or Amazon to know what is it that you're doing, whether you are at your place or not? What if someone actually hacks all of this data, which is centrally located somewhere? Well, the best and most secure way to avoid these issues is simply not to share the data. As simple as that. But in order for you not to share the data, you need to have enough computational capacity and enough uh, uh, and energy efficient enough so that you can integrate it locally. So that's really an area where we see we could, we could change uh, the way that uh, we think about this. And last but not least, uh, bioelectronic medicines. So believe it or not, in a few years from now, uh, we will not be using <coughs> drug compounds as medicines. We would actually be using electronic devices for monitoring our vital signs and interfering with the human body. And that's really the work that bioelectronic, Galvani Bioelectronics is, is developing. It's a startup company that was developed by GSK and Google Life Technologies about two years ago with half a billion pounds investment. That's where Isha now is working at. And, and we're looking in really embedding these new technologies in the human body. Devices like that will be embedded everywhere. We just got another European program that is looking in the more extreme. How can we augment intelligence? <coughs> what can you do about people who actually suffer from Parkinson's or, or, or Alzheimer's? Can you actually, if you have these neuromorphic processing units, that are made out of silicon, out of electronics, out of memristors. Can you make those and go and replace parts of the human brain? We don't know. We certainly like to think that we, we could and we will try. And someone could think of the more extreme case, which is, can we really extend our brain's capacity? Can we become superhumans? Who knows? For sure. Feynman was not only thinking that there is plenty of room at the bottom, but he was also thinking that it's important for understanding something, being able to create that. And we hope that with these new technologies that we develop uh, here at Southampton and together with our other colleagues from Manchester and Imperial to uh, further push the boundaries. What is really the secret recipe for functional memory stores? And I, I would really like to leave you with these few thoughts before I close. So I argued that you know, 
you have two different breakdown points. You have a soft breakdown above which all the magic happens, and then you have the hard breakdown that, that really, you know, you want to stay away from that. And in an ideal world, what we try to do is we try to push these boundaries as much as possible. We try to make easier for us to switch our devices. We try to make it easier for us to get on with our work. And in this particular case, I would argue like Professor Chua that everything is a memory store. And I would say that uh, this lowering of, of the boundaries, this lowering of this switching threshold, you know, where we experience every day in, in our life. And, and I'm really thankful, obviously, to a fantastic team who is carrying out the research and making it a lot easier for us all together to innovate. I'm truly thankful. Uh, but beyond that, we have fantastic colleagues, both here <coughs> as well as uh, at Imperial, <coughs> as well as in other places internationally. And without them, we won't be able to further lower the bounder, make it easier, as well as administrative support, Kate and Angela, who are putting up with my weird requests for pushing the boundaries further. We're really, really thankful, all of you, all of us as a team, to the great work that you're doing, as well as the colleagues from finance department with our last minute request, put another proposal in in the last minute. Uh, you, you know, we really need this. Uh, on the other side, obviously, I'm still a human being, and I need to, I, I want to think that I could actually keep on going for a, for a, a bit more. So that boundary is, uh, is pushed even further by obviously friends, and we have uh, plenty of friends here. Len Lazari, Costas, uh, loads of friends here in the audience. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if I start you know, talking about every individual ones and those that, who couldn't make it today, you know, it will be endless. Uh, on Sundays, I, I chant at the Greek Orthodox Cathedral, either here or one of the cathedrals in, in, in London. And uh, we have a fantastic team there doing that. And that's something really that it's, it's one of my stability factors, obviously. Uh, obviously, family is, is everything. It's important. And uh, today is my, uh, my dad's uh, birthday, so I think my inaugural actually is the best present. So, obviously, none of this would not, would not have happened without Maria and Thank you. It's really amazing because uh, I have this tendency of making my students and my staff cry. And uh, this is the, the very first time. So, so, you know, all of you guys, you know, you got back to me today, OK? Uh, uh, I really think nanotechnology is, is truly exciting. I really think so. And uh, I hope we all have great health to keep going on and pushing further the boundaries. And I, I very much hope that I will have the same excitement with it in, in a few years' time. God knows how many years that would be. Uh, with these little chaps that uh, Lucas, for example, took over for this outreach activity. And <coughs> So I very much hope that we can keep up the excitement and keep producing more and great work you know, like in this area. Thank you so much. So as is appropriate on these occasions, um, and before introducing Professor Chua, um, I offer advice. And I learned three things in my career, and I'm going to share them with you. The first is never, ever 
predict 20 years in the future. <laughs> because I keep a log of my slides over the last 20 years. And I sometimes use them on occasions like this. And the biggest error I have made is 10 to the 7 times. <laughs> okay. So that's my first piece of advice. My second piece of advice, um, since I am uh, your manager now, is succeed in spite of management. And I always tell that to when I go out into schools and I say, succeed in spite of your management. So now I'm your manager, um, I'm going to give you that piece of advice. <laughs> and finally, my last piece of advice is marry a tolerant partner. And because you're a scientist and you are hard to live with. Trust me, I can say that. <laughs> and you clearly did. And so you've obviously already succeeded with that piece of uh, advice. So with that, a fascinating talk. Let me uh, introduce Professor Leon Chua uh, to say a few words uh, of conclusion. Professor Chua. Salvador Dali. Great. Uh, I want to just say a few words. Uh, on, on a similar occasion when uh, Salvador Dali was invited to give a closing remark. And so he sat up and went to the audience saying, I shall be brief today. I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not quite finished, but I'll try to be brief as well. Okay. Uh, I just want to add a few more information regarding Sir Humphrey Davy uh, to convince you that uh, Themis is, in fact, in my opinion, a modern incarnation, reincarnation of Sir Humphrey Davy, which is a, called him a man of all seasons. Uh, Themis didn't mention it, but Sir Humphrey Davy is a, a supremely talented person with a, a multiple uh, abilities. For example, uh, he was the, he discovered sodium and he discovered potassium. That was, those were the days when Mendeley just present, published his table. There were a lot of holes, sodium and potassium were some of them. And he, he discovered both of them in short order. <coughs> and, uh, he also was known for something totally unrelated to uh, to chemistry, and and uh, in fact, uh, if you know any miner, uh, in 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 the old days, uh, you know the mines have this common monoxide that has all over there, so you it's poisonous. So so the, so so they would have these canary birds. So the canary birds, uh, uh, that's why right, you know in, in the Canary Islands. They, they were very sensitive when if they uh, poisonous gas, the, the, girl would, the, the girl would die, you know, so that would, that would tell the man to get out, okay? And uh, it turned out that uh, if you were if you knew any miner and they would tell you, you can ask them, what's, what's a Davies slum? There's such a thing called a Davies slum. And he invented that just because he was told a story about all these canary birds, and he invented that and, and, and that, no one uses canary birds anymore. It's just they just have a, a, a Davis lab, totally unrelated to his field. So this this was just two uh, instances that to tell you that he's a multifaceted man. Was always tenuous. Uh He 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 knew so many things, and uh, also he's uh, he, he's very broad and deep. Uh, for example, uh, he may not realize that Membristo uh, is, is unlike transistor or a major invention, or, or a Joseph Junction, another major invention, or a Saki diode, another invention. These are all double price inventions. And, uh, but those were very specific inventions involving one material or, or one or two materials only. And, and uh, so it can be very specialized. But 
Chemists realize that memory storage is much broader. And, and, and the memory store is not just one specific material. And so he uh, like to think of memory store is like, <coughs> like a, a espresso or cappuccino or macchiato or cafe latte. Uh, they're all different names. And so in fact, uh, nowadays, in, in, if you look at literature, there are all kinds of names uh, like uh, atomic switch, uh, metal oxide devices, perovskite, uh, all, all kinds of different names, uh, uh, or e e even different material. You can, you can, for example, make uh, memory stores out of uh, metal oxide of all uh, ferromagnetic materials, and and uh, uh, even more, more recently, about two years ago, there were people making memories out of egg yolks. So there are all kinds of ways uh, to make memory stores, and and Temes, uh, realized that, and he so he's extremely broad. He doesn't think of one memory as just one device, and he can, he doesn't believe it's just one name. It, he realizes that all of these different names are in fact all memory stores. So, so he he's, he's extremely broad, and 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 and, and deep. That's that's a new, uh, uh, amazing talent that, that he has. So, so in other words, uh, Ten Mace, in my opinion, is 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 a real star. He, he's a future star, just beginning the career. He's going to have great contributions. And uh, finally, I want to close by saying that uh, there's also one aspect that many of you, most of you didn't know uh, about Temis, and that is, uh, in addition to this talent, he also has something similar to the kind of Davis, Davis uh, land. And that is, uh, he's a conductor. You know, and on every Sunday, uh, he, would, he would devote a Sunday for something non-technical. He would go to, 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 to a, uh, a church, an Orthodox church, and he would conduct, okay? And then he would devote the rest of his days to his children, and of course to Maria. He's a great husband, he's a great father. He's, he's a wonderful man. So I uh, salute you, uh, Temis, and thank you for your attention. Outside, um, and uh, sadly we uh, we don't have time to do the roasting in public because we've run out of time. So I would suggest you do it in private outside, and then share the answers in the listening <laughs> campaign, uh, so that we can make him feel that he has truly been inaugurated into the professorship of the University of Southampton. So thank you once again. We salute you, Terence.